gained over 31, 31% equity year over year in the third quarter. So when you look at, at using, utilizing some of this equity, it's important to know what options are available and how to, how to uh, tap into that equity to possibly buy some future property. And so that's part of what we wanted to discuss with you guys is kind of dive into those details. Um, as far as the options that are available, it, it really goes with, you know, the programs that, that are allowed in today's market. And here's what I mean by that. So if somebody's wanted to buy an investment property today, uh, it's different today versus 12 months or two years from ago. And the reason why is there's a big challenge in our market today, and it has to do with the inventory that's in our market. There's not enough houses, too many people buying houses. And, and with that, is creating a higher price point of sales price. So our affordability rate is really challenged right now. So for an investor that's wanting to buy a, an investment property, one of the first things that you're going to be prepared, want to be prepared for is understanding that the price is just going to be higher. So when you buy an investment property, your rate's going to be higher than if you were to purchase a primary residence. And here's how that looks. So today's market mortgage rates are going up a little bit. We're seeing mortgage rates still doing some really positive things, staying around high threes, um, low fours, which is excellent mortgage rates. But if you're looking at buying an investment property, those mortgage rates are probably going to be about 1% higher. So just you want to be prepared for that. Uh, scores are also important. So when you qualify for your mortgage, the higher the credit score, the, uh, the better the mortgage rate, along with the better, better cost that's involved with qualifying for that mortgage. So um, now the affordability, that piece of it is tied in with that pricing. So the FHFA has decided to adjust pricing for investment properties, which has made it, which has made that difference that wide. So the 3.8 versus the four, uh, you know, the higher 4.8, 5% mortgage rates for, for investment properties. Uh, they're trying to counter the, uh, the, 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 for raising the cost for investment properties to help offset the first time buyer programs for lower mortgage rates and offering lower uh, mortgage insurance and more flexible first time buyer programs. So these are the things that are causing the, the pricing to increase on investment properties. Um, but as far as the, the programs themselves, you, you can actually buy an investment property with as little as 15% down. Um, but what I'd love to hear from uh, the smart team is, you know, someone purchasing a property in today's market what was what are some of the things that you want to you want the buyers to be prepared for uh, when it comes to buying their first investment property? Are you guys muted? Yeah, I th I think we're muted. Pam, oh, okay. Pam, are you there? I'll, I'll answer. I'll pick it up. Oh yeah, she's muted. Okay. Um, I think John, I'm on John, would you repeat your question again? Because we just had three people join. Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, someone buying a house in today's market, uh, what, what are some of the things that a, a investor should prepare themselves for when they're buying that investment property? Maybe for the first time with, you know, the, everything that all the challenges that we're seeing with, with today's market. Well, I just, I just met some people this weekend at a house and um, we looked at a house and the reality was based upon typical market that house was a, it was it was a duplex and if you were just looking at it in a normal market it it actually appears to be overpriced so they were like well then I don't know that I want to do it we're cash do you think that that you know will up us one and I'm like no because a lot of people are these days so you're probably gonna have to go over asking and they're like well I thought you said the house really actually isn't worth this price point and I said well based upon a CMA and looking at numbers it's not, but they're going to get it. So it really comes back to you. Do, do you want it? You've got to determine, does it fit your portfolio? And is it worth that investment to you in the long run? And so they felt like it did and they were cash and they had the ability to close as soon as title could close. They offered to pay the title policy, the survey, everything needed closed as quick as title could close them. And they went 6,000 over on a house that really, if you just looked at the numbers, John, wasn't even worth what they were asking. And we lost out and we came in fourth mm -hmm. out of all the offers submitted. 
So I think just letting your buyers know you were you were in a bidding war on these multiple family properties right now. And the wow. numbers, the CMA is not going to reflect what you need to pay for this. I love that. Yeah, that, that's that's absolutely the truth. We're going through these experiences and, you know, buyer buy-in is really important. It's important to understand that in today's market, you've got to go above asking price because the inventory is so tight. The inventory in today's market is like one to 1.5 months of houses on today's market. So if you're going to win a bid, although you're buying this asset property, you don't want to be prepared to go above that price to win that offer. The, the goal of this is, is going to be long-term. So the time frame of ownership will be really important because your appreciation rate is still going to do really well. Another good statistic for you guys to kind of share um, the youth in our in our economy, the demographic of, eight, of, of individuals under the age of 30 or entering their 30s is about 5 million per year. So that's a, that's going to be a robust demand of real estate in the next, you know, five to 10 years. So we have a long runway ahead of us. So that's a great point. Um, the other, the other thing I wanted to touch on is cash purchases. How many cash purchases are you seeing out there today? More than usual? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're seeing that as well. We're seeing, uh, you know, our, our clients are coming to us and trying to figure out, should I buy this house cash or should I put it a, a mortgage to buy the property? And, and, you know, a good friend of mine in the industry uses this example and it's simple to understand and it's easy to follow. So I'm going to, I'm going to share it with you guys. So think about it this way. Let's say that somebody has a hundred thousand dollars cash and they find a property that's a hundred thousand. So they buy that hundred thousand dollars cash, that property with cash, they hold it for 10 years. And after that 10 year period, that property is now worth, let's say 150. Well, their cash on cash investment, the 100,000 just turned into 150,000. Uh, well, actually, I'm sorry. Yeah, 150,000, which is a 50% cash on cash return on their investment. Their 100,000 turned into 50,000 is basically how that translates. Now, if you put 10% down on that same property, so you put $10,000 down on a $100,000 purchase, and you hold that property for the same timeline, 10 years. Out of that 10 year period, property is still worth 150,000. That cash on cash investment, your $10,000 just turned into a 500% cash on cash return on your investment. So when it comes to paying cash, you want to leverage other people's money to make more money based on what your investments look like. So it's great to pay cash, but at the same time, you want to leverage those monies for maybe some future purchases that, uh, you know, th that may be coming up, whether it's stocks or real estate purchases. So, uh, but that's a good analogy that a friend of mine uses. And um, I wanted to share that with you guys. Um, as far as the programs that are available, so I want to talk a little bit about what the requirements are to buy an investment property when it comes to a mortgage. So qualifying for a mortgage. First, it starts off with credits. You want to have a, a really good credit score of at least a 700. Um, if you're below 700, it's okay. We could still offer a product. That rate's going to be a little higher, as we touched on earlier. Uh, down payment, the down payment requirements are about, it starts off at 15% for the minimum down payment. Uh, and you, it can go as, as deep as 20 to 25% or more. Uh, the more you place down, the better the mortgage rate is what that's going to look like. So um, you can buy a property with as little as 10, 15%, but putting 20% is always recommended. Um, multifamily is a little different. So if you have a property that is uh, two units or more, those, those down payment requirements are going to be a little stricter. So you're going to have a 25% down payment requirement for that particular purchase. So it's a 25% down payment for a multifamily property. Okay, so uh, as far as leveraging equity and tapping it, you own a home today, the cash out refi requirements for these products is, or these refinances is gonna be 80% loan to value. So the property, let's say you have a property worth 100,000, 80% of that would be 80,000. So the mortgage, would have to be below that 80,000 80, and that would be your cash out that you can tap into to uh, to purchase that next investment property. Do you guys have any questions? I feel like I'm rambling now. <laughs> no, you're doing great. 
I think okay. anyone. I have yeah. a question. Yes. How for um how do you know when it's time it, you would be at a good time to make another investment um, in a property? Good question. Yeah, a really good question. Uh, a lot of that will depend on uh, two things. Well, actually, three things. First, it's, it starts off with the uh, the credit score. Second, it's going to be the uh, the availability of assets. So, seeing not only what type of equity position you may have on your property today, but how much money you've saved in your accounts so far. And let me explain that. So, when you buy an investment property, the mortgage company is going to want to see that you have some savings outside of your out-of-pocket expenses. So you'll have your down payment, you'll have closing costs, and then you'll have the, uh, the collection of your escrow, your taxes and your insurance. So most mortgage companies wanna see that you have at least two months reserves, which is two months future mortgage payments in an account somewhere to offset some future losses. Investment properties are a little stronger. So the total reserves for investment properties are actually at uh, six months. So you want six months future mortgage payments uh, on this type of on this type of transaction. So just to sum that up, you'll want reserves hold about six months. That could be 401k. That could be investments, um, and you'll want about the 20% down payment with closing costs and prepaids. Does that answer your question? Awesome. Okay. Uh, so cash out refis, guy, uh, guys, there's a, uh, there's a couple ways to do this. It depends on the type of property. So if you have a, a single family home, the uh, loan to values would be 80%. If you have an investment property, let's say you, you own a home, it's an investment property, and you want to tap into that equity to buy the next one, the loan to value for that has to be 75%. So we're going to be capped out at 75% loan to value. Uh, if one of your investment properties is a multifamily, then we're looking at a 70% loan to value. So you have to have a 70% max for that. Um, hey, Marla, you guys had mentioned there's a um, an return on investment calculator that you guys had. I was just going it, to, it's the gross, uh, gross income multiplier. And I just thought it would be just kind of fun to share that because, you know, when you're at home looking at houses and just wonder, oh, would this be a good investment? It's just kind of a quick, easy way, um, just a rough measure to get it. It's it's not exact, but it's just kind of gives you an idea. Um, so the gross income multiplier, you take the sales price, let's say $250,000, and you divide it by the, first you got to figure out kind of an estimate of what you would get per month. Let's say you think you can get $2,000 a month in rent then um, you can add up the annual rent, which would be 24,000. And so when you divide those two numbers, that gives you the gross income multiplier number. And I did the calculations, that, that one comes out to 10.4. Um, on average, you kind of see anywhere from 10 to 13, somewhere in there. So um, the, higher, the higher the number, the better. I've heard that rental uh, income can be anywhere from like 1%, 1% rental, the rental market could be 1% of the sales price, maybe just a little under that as just like a kind of a rule of thumb. Yeah. 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 A rough estimate. Yeah. So that's pretty conservative because if you had 250 and you're using 2000 for that rent, that's a pretty realistic, Correct. yeah, pretty comfortable, realistic number. Yes. Okay, uh, what, and appreciation. Uh, so you want me to touch on that or do you uh, have that in your- that, Well, yeah, that would be awesome to go over because I was just gonna say, even, even if you're looking at an investment property and you don't think you can get a bunch of cash flow, um, just the fact that you're gonna get some appreciation um, is, is a really good benefit uh, and depending on how long you hold on to the property. So yeah, if you have anything to touch on that, that would be great. Okay. Uh, so guys, appreciation has been awesome. Uh, if anyone on the call today owns a property, they know their property has gone like in, in a great, great increase of value. So home appreciation has been really unique over the last two years. We've seen appreciation rates go from, uh, you know, last like 10%. Uh, there was even some statistics showing about 12% on appreciation. We're not going to see that this year. We're probably going to see about 8%, uh, maybe 10% again on appreciation which is really abnormal. Like we, we really 
we're, it's, it's not something that we're, we should be seeing. Uh, appreciation really should be about 5%, like four and a half, five percent San Antonio's history of home values has just been about that, right around that 5% mark. So let's just use that as a rule of thumb. And if we looked at that same sales price of 250 and we held it for 12 months, that property on a, just a conservative uh, appreciation of 5% would be about 262. So you would have what Marla was touching on is your monthly rental income um, offset by that mortgage. The mortgage would depend on the balance on that home at that time. Uh, and then the appreciation increase as well over time. So investment properties is really a great way to do this now while the market's still pretty fresh. Um, the return on investment also has to do with the initial investment of that property, the down payment, the closing cost. And we can, we can definitely dive into that too um, as well. Uh, so here's what that would look like. I'm gonna go ahead and touch on that, but you know, let, me, let me open it up and see if anybody has any questions. Hey, John, I have a quick question. Yes, sir. Do you ever have um, like couples um, or individuals come to you and want to invest jointly together, let's say two or three couples? And if so, what is that? How does that, you know, what does that look like as far as costs and things like that? Great question. Great question. And let me tell you why it's such a great question. Um, it's all about long term investment. If you have somebody that is a, a, a group of people that want to buy real estate, it's important to ask how many do they plan to buy in the next five, 10 years? Because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the investors that hold these mortgages are going to cap you off at about 10, 10 properties. So if your goal is 20 and everybody's on these mortgages, you've now capped everyone at 10, 10 units. So if uh, you can have this, to answer your question, you can have as many people on the application as you like. But if the group is planning to buy multiple properties, then I would always ask a question of, let's find out how many individually you plan to buy so we don't cap off that number so we can continue to collect and accumulate real estate as we go i love that question i've got a question um i just met with a couple last week and they were talking about their current home and their their home's value probably is about 380 they they owe probably about three hundred thousand on their home the value of their homes probably about four fifty. So okay. they were asking about cashing out that hundred and fifty thousand from their primary residence. What what would you as a lender? What would your recommendation be as far as do they do they look at that up front and cash the whole thing? At, like, do they take that whole hundred and fifty thousand and put it somewhere and then start buying properties, or do they? do like um, a cash out of 30,000 for what they need at the time and then wait and, and borrow, you know, another 50 when they find another property that they want to do. So that's does that good. make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. It does. Yeah. And it's good you're asking that because uh, cash out refis are expensive. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. You've got uh, title fees, you have lender fees on general, you're looking close to really close to about five, $6,000. So you want to do this one time. Okay. I would recommend, you know, if the goal is to buy investment properties, do it one time, get as much as you can that's comfortable within your budget and, and allow and just put it in an account and then allow that to uh, to sit while you continue to accumulate uh, your properties that you want to buy. So, yeah, I would definitely say one time tap it in. And, and does that have does that have any impact on their current home on their primary residence what do you mean i don't know and i wish i could remember the exact question that he asked me okay i think like mine would be was their month monthly mortgage go up since they did a cash out refi or what happens say that one more time I, I didn't i didn't hear you i'm sorry does the monthly mortgage go up on their primary residence if they do a cash out refi? Oh, gotcha. Yes, yeah, so it'll go up. It'll go up and the rate will change. So we've just left a period where mortgage rates have been the lowest that they've been in history. So some of these clients, some clients have rates that are really low. It's not gonna be the same when it's time to do that cash out refi. It's gonna be a lot higher. Uh, the 
the idea when you cash out of the property is to understand that you're leveraging your money to buy another property. So if you were to get a higher rate on that cash out refi, the payment goes up, but the actual goal is to continue to accumulate houses. We just covered a good example of that rent, uh, rent versus mortgage. Uh, so if you've got an income producing property along with depreciation, you're gonna gain more than the interest that you're losing on that cash out refi through home appreciation along with um, you know, the write-offs of having a rental property and, and the income stream that you're receiving from the, uh, from, the, from the renters along with the reduction in your mortgage because someone else is now paying that mortgage. So to answer your question, yeah, the mortgage payment will go up, but you have plenty of other resources that'll help offset that additional expense. So John, does, so if your mortgage pay, does your mortgage payment remain the same and you get a new loan for the, the amount you cashed out or it totally refinances your mortgage in now with that 60,000 you just took out? That's right, yeah, so totally recapitalize that loan and that payment could potentially go up. A lot of it depends on the lifetime of that mortgage because sometimes with the principal and interest, that new mortgage loan, that payment at that higher rate and higher balance may actually reset really close to that previous mortgage payment if that mortgage has been held for a long time. Because now you've paid down the principal and you've uh, actually kept that mortgage payment that's paying more towards principal and allowing that new reset of a loan closer to um, what that new future payment is going to be. So I guess that's a way to say it will completely and totally depend, but uh, you want to prepare for that mortgage payment to just be a little higher because you are tapping into the equity of that property. Does that answer your question? What Patty just asked is what his question was. I just couldn't remember how he had phrased it, but that was it was like, could he keep his other mortgage and only get a new mortgage for the amount that he was cash out refined? But it sounds like that's a no. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that would be a no. Uh, actually, okay. uh, you could do, there is a home equity line of credit. That's so you, like, there is a home equity line of credit that would give you a totally separate second mortgage based on the, the amount that you, that you want. Um, the lenders are starting to do less of those, but but it's out there. And generally, those mortgages are going to be on a on an adjustable rate. So that rate's going to fluctuate with the market versus just having that one mortgage payment. So you want to look at the pros and cons and have an idea of what that would result in the mortgage expense, along with the interest having that second lien. Uh, but but they are out there. Second mortgages, home equity line of credit to tap into the the equity versus just doing one mortgage as a cash out refi. Yeah, also, if you've had a loan for a long time and you recast your mortgage, you're gonna be getting a higher deduction to a higher write-off. That's a good, that's a good point. I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, that would be a, uh, are you, are you uh, that would be a CPA. Uh, that's a good, that's a good point. I think, I believe you're right on that. So I had heard uh, someone else had share where, can you, all, can you all hear me okay? Sorry. Um, where uh, you should get a property that you would want as your investment property, but get it as like your primary residence, live in it for six months to a year, and then go buy the actual property you want to live in and use the first one as like your Airbnb. But like, can you keep doing that and just live in these houses for six months to a year and just keep on using them as your primary residence to avoid that huge down payment? That's a good point. That fraud. <laughs> <laughs> like, because I was, well, me and, me and my cousin were talking about it yesterday because she really wants to do Airbnbs. And I was, that thought came to mind. I'm like, but how many times can you use the primary residence? And like, but you would actually have to live in it. I understand that. But I was just curious, like, how far that could go. Yes. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's a good question. At a certain point, it's going to be a property accumulation. So as a mortgage company, we will see that as, as a red flag. Because if you, if it's, translated into a purchase every six months uh it's it's too fast uh but you'll, you could probably do that for the first like couple uh and the the uh over time you'll want to you the last one validation of that being an actual primary residence but initially yeah you can you can certainly buy a primary residence live in it for a little bit and then buy the buy the next property
Do you guys have any other questions? That, those questions. were some, yeah, those are some great questions. I think we're hitting our 30 minute session, but if John, if you want to close it out, have any other um, tips for us? You know, I, I would just say anyone interested in doing an investment property or even just testing the waters to see what it would take to qualify, if you're ready, what the payment in, in scenarios are going to look like. It, it starts with just having that initial discussion. So the SMART team, phenomenal group of people, uh, they can definitely help you with, you know, what's available in the market and what the market conditions are doing today. But if you'd like to know what it takes to qualify, you know, us, we're all partnered together in this. So we can definitely do that pretty easily with uh, get you, getting you guys some answers and results on that. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah, if you want more in-depth analysis of what we talked about today, um, please contact John because he can definitely um, take a look and, and get you going in the right direction. Um, and... and we're good with questions. No more questions. Any anyone else? I think we're good. I just wanted to kind of end with I. The great thing about real estate, to me, is it's a form of forced savings. So if you do have that money in the bank account that John was talking to you about, if you've got six months saved up, if you've got you know fifteen twenty percent down. Um, and you're looking at, well, should I, should I pull the trigger or not? Um, I mean, look at it this way. If that money's sitting there, if it were me, I would probably spend it on just, you know, whatever else, instead of actually, um, investing in, in really seeing that money, um, appreciate over time and possibly gaining some cash flow. So I, I just, me personally think it's just a great, um, just way great place to put your money into. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for, for joining the call and the time. Uh, we really appreciate you guys tuning in. And uh, y'all have any questions? You have, you have a great supporting team here. Yes. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining the SMART team here. And we hope to see you guys soon. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thanks, Marla, for putting thank this together. You. Thank you, guys.